Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us today to share our enthusiasm about the amazing uh, biodiversity in the San Francisco Bay Area and California. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit about CNPS, evangelize a little bit about them. Um, California Native Plant Society is the leading uh, California plant conservation science nonprofit in the state. And uh, their mission is to connect people with California's amazing and hugely diverse native plants. They were created in 1965 by Bay Area conservationists. And today it consists of over 40 conservation scientists and professionals uh, who mostly operate out of the Sacramento office. And there are 35 volunteer run chapters um, we are the of uh, the uh, Yerba Buena chapter, which covers the San Francisco Peninsula north of Highway 92. And uh, there's a Marin chapter, of course, at Contra Costa chapter. Uh, the Contra Costa and Alameda are wrapped into the East Bay chapters. And they've all got wonderful resources to share. In 1995, uh, CNPS published a manual of California vegetation. Uh, and that was California's first resource to capture plant species and locations. And since then, working hand in hand with the state agencies, we've had no further plant species extinctions uh, in the state, which is, you know, prior to that, there we were losing plants kind of pretty regularly. And some of you may be aware of uh, Golden Gate Audubon, but that's the local chapter of Audubon. And it covers uh, San Francisco, Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Um, and they've been around since 1917, so over a hundred years. And they've been connecting people with birds and protecting birds and bird habitat. So um, they're a really wonderful organization. They also have uh, free field trips and speaker programs. So if you're not familiar with them, um, I encourage you to take a look at uh, their website. Now, um, we'd like to talk a little bit about birds and why uh, we feel they're awesome. They are really an incredible um, resource. They uh, pollinate plants. They eat crop pests. Uh, they connect people with nature, um, different seasons. You'll see different species of birds. And um, birds have um, an intrinsic value and a cultural value. People talk about it like the dove of peace. Um, and so there's significance there. Um, but birds are also um, an economic resource. Um, they're in the US. There are 46 million people that consider themselves bird watchers, and they spend over $107 billion each year on travel, books, uh, bird feeders, seed, and more. So um, birds really are important to all of us. So um, why should we care about birds here? Well, we are really located in a central location for birds. We're in the uh, midst of the Pacific Flyway, which is a, a major migratory route for birds. They travel uh, north each year to their breeding grounds, and they travel south each year to their uh, wintering grounds. Some uh, birds do stay here all year long, but, um, you know, because this is such an incredible place, um, some some birds like from Alaska and Canada come here for the winter, so you can see them right now. Um, and uh, San Francisco Bay was uh, recognized as a, um, in 1988, it was recognized at, by the United Nations Scientific and Cultural Organization, uh, known as UNESCO, um, as the Golden Gate uh, biosphere Reserve. So um, it's really an important area and it's been uh, globally recognized. In um, 2013, uh, the bay itself was recognized as a wetland of international importance by the Ramsar Convention. And that's an intergovernmental uh, convention on wetlands and the importance of, uh, of birds, of uh, this area for birds. So um, 
Over 500 species of birds have been observed in the San Francisco Bay Area, and that's a huge number. Um, these are all different species, and, um, and there's something you can get out and enjoy any day. Yeah, we're super lucky to, to be living here in this, uh, in this place. As you can see from this uh, international, um, well, this is a map of the US, that it's a biodiversity map. So basically this map is showing us where the highest uh, number of species per area is. And you can kind of see, yeah, Florida is pretty cool, Texas, but look at California. I mean, it's just really a biologically special place. Has uh, by far the largest biological diversity of any state with over 6,000 native plants over 30% of which are endemic, which means they are only here. And uh, the Bay Area is right at the heart of the special place. So yet, yeah, you know, as you probably have read, there, there's definitely problems. So uh, we're gonna have to share a little bit of that sad news. Uh, and, but, um, you know, you probably heard about some of these long-term studies showing bird population declines uh, Audubon came out with the state of the birds, and it was a pretty sobering study. Um, and this is this uh, this the study was a, not based on conjecture. They actually had um, uh, data, real hard data, going back um, over eighty years to to look at this. And so anyway, we've had declines since 1970 of 30% of our birds. And um, there's other studies that are talking about the decline of the insect species. Um, maybe not so much in some areas, but really dramatically so in others. Uh, so we've got all these incredible natural features here in the Bay Area, but uh, birds and insects are declining here too, even though we're still seeing quite a lot because of our special spot on the, uh, in the world. So uh, over, the over the past century, much of this rich contiguous landscape of ecologically healthy land has been transformed into this developed space with exotic, exotic plants and turf grass. Um, so 41% um, of all North American bird species who migrate to Mexico, Central and South America are declining. And these issues are related and there are things that everyone can do to help. There's more than 10 million acres of land in the US were converted or developed from 1982 to 1997. So birds now have fewer places to raise their young and safely rest and recover during migration. And while we can see birds plucking worms and, from, and such from lawns, they, lawns just don't offer enough food or shelter for many bird species. So with more than 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S., there's a huge potential to support wildlife by replacing lawn with native planting. So our, while our local uh, mild climate will support plants from many parts of the world. Many of these do not contribute to the local ecology in a beneficial way. So some folks argue that since we're part of nature, these introductions are natural and local species will simply adapt over time or naturally die out. But um, the problem is, with that argument is that most of these evolutionary adaptations take thousands or even millions of years uh, for, uh, for unique natural creations. Ecological stressors and imbalances move toward uh, generalist species and away from um, specialist species. So historically, this process has um, happened uh, before most major extinction events. Today, in many landscape parts of the San Francisco Bay Area, there are very few native plants left. Um, in some areas, people here in the city have even traded their gardens for concrete and artificial turf. Sometimes referred to as drifting baseline syndrome, over time, 
without natural reminders and cues from our unique, beautiful, <clears throat> and geographically distinct natural heritage, humans lose memories and connections. <laughs> nope. Uh -oh. They no longer see these connections and may have difficulty imagining what it was like. Um, so at some point, it's like trying to explain the color blue to someone who is colorblind. Um, it's very difficult to explain or to imagine. Fortunately, here in California, there are many uh, relatively intact and biologically functioning uh, remnant landscapes for us to uh, see and learn from. So let's take a look at what birds need. Um, a bird-friendly uh, backyard garden or garden uh, can provide essential things that birds need. Um, this will be especially popular if you have an adjacent open space or your neighbors also uh, provide a critical mass of these offerings. Just like us, birds need clean water and air and a place to rest and a place to raise their family in order to thrive. Most birds need to drink water and use it to keep their feathers clean. Plants provide places for birds to hide and rest. And uh, birds' nests are super variable um, from simple scrapes on the ground to cavities to elaborate stick nests, but almost all birds uh, need some sort of plant-based structure. This chart shows the amount of energy measured in kilojoules of the various items that birds eat. It also shows the amount of water provided by, by these food sources. So many birds get most, or and a few get all of their water from the, uh, the food that they eat. Fruit and nectar are mostly water. Leaves, seeds, grasses, nuts, and insects are also contained and provide water. Birds are 60 to 70% water, very similar to us. It's amazing that most birds eat 25 to 30 percent of their weight each day, though eating like a bird would be impossible for us. Um, the fat content in the fruit of native plants is 10 times more nourishing than most non-native ornamental um, berries. Nuts and seeds like this acorn woodpecker at the bottom um, are, provide high amounts of protein and calories. Um, for even higher metabolisms like the hummingbird, plant nectar is really indispensable. A fourth food group that um, most of us don't really think about uh, is also provided by plants and that's insects. Um, you can see this Western tanager eating a pine beetle. 96% of songbirds feed their chicks insects, and uh, even species who eat mostly uh, plants consume some insects, especially when they're raising young. Many birds switch to insects to get that extra energy and protein um, either during breeding or uh, to prepare for migration during the spring or the fall. In, uh, a in 2018, there was a um, science in nature study that estimated that worldwide birds eat about 450 million tons of insects. That's equivalent to 20 quadrillion bugs each year. Glad that, that they did the calculation. Um, <laughs> it's a good thing for us because all this eating protects us and it also protect, protects plants, including uh, crops. Birds eat a tremendous amount of mosquitoes, rodents, and crop pests. Here we see a downy woodpecker, and it's eating a uh, gall wasp larva in an oak tree. This chart shows that almost, of almost 10,000 bird species, the majority, over 5,000 species, eat insects. This is the same worldwide and in North America. Some birds, like woodpeckers, flycatchers, vireo, sparrows, and warblers, almost exclusively eat insects. We call them insectivores. Omnivores, like the American robin, they eat primarily insects during the nesting season, and then they switch to mostly berries in the winter. And baby birds, they eat a lot. Chestnut-backed chickadees start out very small. Their eggs are the size of the tip of my small finger. 
At two weeks, each one of these little birds has to grow from the size of a tiny egg to a little bird covered in feathers that can fly out of, out of the nest. It's kind of amazing, huh? Two weeks. 570 caterpillars for 16 days, over, over 9,000 caterpillars. Frugivorous birds like waxworms are the next most populous, then seed eaters and nectarvores. A bird species is considered a specialist if its preferred food makes up half or more of its diet, insects, nectars, and seeds. It is extremely rare for any species to be in just one category. For example, hummingbirds primarily focus on nectar, but also eat insects, especially when raising young. When you see those Hummingbirds up there dancing around. A lot of times they're catching these like tiny microscopic midges out of the air. Goldfinches eat mostly seeds, but also eat insects when they're raising their young. So you might wonder why does this matter? Um, and then you may recall that uh, food web from biology class, um, the importance of the uh, relationship of plants to animals, including humans, is largely about insects, particularly the caterpillars of butterflies and moths. Plants are the only organism that can transform the energy of the sun into food, and insects are the world's primary herbivores. The plant eaters that transform most of that energy to the rest of the food web and to birds. Native plants and insects co-evolve together <laughs> over millions of years. So our native insects are not adapted to feed on alien plant species, which dominate our traditional urban and suburban uh, landscapes. Without native plants, many na native insects have nothing to eat. So the plants are indeed fundamental. Um, <laughs> this is a difficult chart to see, but um, and we're going to stop with, <laughs> with all these charts. Um, <laughs> Thomas, last one. <laughs> but um, it does depict um, why this matters. Um, and Dr. Doug Talame um, is a, and uh, researchers from the University of Delaware um, conducted a study on the East Coast, and they looked at native plants and the insects that they attract. Uh, his research was adapted by uh, Kathy Kramer and her husband, um, and some of you may have heard of her. She does a uh, bringing back the natives event in the spring. Um, anyway, they converted the plant species here on the West Coast. And this chart shows the local native plants and the insect species that are attracted to them. So you can see on the uh, left that the oak is the highest, followed by the holly leaf cherry, and then um, you see other uh, local natives like the cottonwood, the alder, pine, fir, rose, elderberry, lupin, sagebrush, hazelnut, and beech strawberry. But um, exotic plants like agapanthus, ice plant, ginkgo, um, and Mediterranean grasses have almost no value uh, to, uh, to these uh, butterflies or uh, insects. Um, so um, not all plants are native to all counties, and that's what makes the Bay Area so special. By planting local natives, you can attract the most species of insects, and those insects will in turn attract the most birds. So by adding uh, native plants, um, you, you can watch the birds come in. Um, they add interest and beauty to your yard and your neighborhood and provide shelter and nesting areas for uh, local birds. The nectar, seeds, berries, and insects will sustain the birds and a diverse wildlife. So coevolution is defined as evolution involving a series of reciprocal changes in two or more non-interbreeding populations that have a close, close ecological relationship and act as agents of natural selection for each other. Our native fauna co-evolved with all the local native flora species in each ecological system. And these systems can be amazingly small or quite large. The Bay Area has many, many of these. These species each evolve defense mechanisms to survive with one another. Primarily, it starts with the, these biochemical battles. Chemical defenses evolve by plants to ward off insects who want to eat them. 
cloaking, mimicry, and chemical defenses evolved by those insects to ward off birds, et cetera, and on up the food chain. Our birds, other wildlife and plants have evolved to this location. These species have been working out balancing acts for millenniums, literally since the beginning of life. And in special locations like islands or island-like conditions, specialists often evolve, which creates high levels of endemism. And here in California, where there is a very high prevalence of endemism, there's to these some very specific locations here. Our native plants are perfectly adapted to what's often referred to as the Mediterranean climate, but really um, it would be more appropriate to call this the coastal California climate. Our local climate is characterized by winter rain and summer drought, and it's similar to um, other regional climates, but each one of those include unique eco ecologies too, so um, they're independent of each other. The planting season here is in uh, late fall and winter, which is difficult for people that have relocated here to um, adjust to, um, but it's really the right time. Um, <laughs> since California is relatively young uh, geologically, our soil conditions are super diverse. Um, you might have clay, uh, sand, loam, um, there are riparian areas and a wide variety of rock substrates. So each of these microclimates and the soil diversity add some complexity to planning for your garden, but um, the best plants uh, would be suited to the soil and um, the location. Um, I'll, and there are a lot of wonderful tools and resources that we're going to share later on to help you with that, those plant selections. California Thrasher is a good example of specialization. Range maps of the California Thrasher are almost identical to those of the California coffee berry. And there are many similar examples. In 2013, the East Bay chapter of CNPS checklisted an amazing 1,303 extant native plant tax in Alameda and Contra Costa counties. Mm -hmm. But what the garden for? Mm -hmm. Um, as I mentioned earlier, over 500 bird species have been documented in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it's actually 498 in San Francisco County alone. Um, and when you want to look at what to garden for, um, most since most birds rely primarily on insects, and those insects rely on native plants, you want to choose local native plants that are suitable for your area. That's by, by far the best way to attract and help local uh, birds. Here uh, you can see a finch enjoying um, a, a recently hatched termite. Um, we're glad about that. And um, also on the right hand side, you can see a Townsend's warbler finding larva in a live oak tree. Most most songbirds and other bird families depend on caterpillars to feed their super fast growing young. See all those uh, eaten leaves on, uh, on your plants? That's actually a good thing. Caterpillars are superfood, wonderful packets of yummy protein and calories, or so I've heard. Uh, so flower power <laughs> is really important. Um, the nectar uh, from flowers is, is really great for hummingbirds and for uh, a variety of other bird species. Um, and we have a variety of local native wildflowers and flowering shrubs to choose from. Um, plant these and you'll see orioles, hummingbirds, and native bees. Um, the photo on the Left is a hummingbird at a California fuchsia. Um, on the right is an Anna's hummingbird at a bee plant. And then in the center, um, not to scale, uh, is an oriole. Orioles are actually about the size of a robin, so a much larger bird than a hummingbird. There are over uh, 20,000 scientifically described bee species in the world. Um, eight of them are honeybee species, and all are in the uh, genus 
APHIS, um, and they're all native to Eurasia. So um, by far, they received the most attention in the press. But um, it's really incredible to know that there are over 4,000 bee species that are native to the United States and about 1,000 that are native to California, 150 in San Francisco alone. Um, there's been research done at San Francisco State University. And um, you can see from this uh, description, um, there are a lot of um, uh, plant species that will attract a variety of these local native bee species. And many of these are, the majority of these bee species do not uh, sting people. Um, yeah, that's the honeybee. That <laughs> the honeybees protecting the honey. <laughs> and that, that's the European uh, bee. So um, anyway, more on more support for local natives. Okay. Where are we here? Okay, <laughs> fruiting plants like toyon, coffee berry, and elderberry are all local keystone plant species, super valuable to migrants and overwintering birds. They're deep roots, native perennial bunch grasses. I'm getting off here somehow. Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. There we go. Um, with, their, uh, with their deep roots, native perennial bunch grasses not only offer exceptional carbon sequestration rates, but also draw seed eating birds like this purple finch and, and sooty fox sparrow, mm -hmm. which there are sooty fox sparrows. There's, your birders are probably, they're disappearing. They're heading back up to their sootiness up in uh, Alaska and, and California. A diversity of plants in your garden adds interest and it can also add birds. You'll see uh, birds feeding on lawns, but they support only a few species. Uh, lawns typically require fertilizer, high amounts of irrigation and maintenance, which involves air and noise pollution. Instead, choose from some of our really gorgeous uh, local native uh, grasses and ground covers and wildflowers. Um, these are great for moths and butterflies and also provide bird food. And of course, wildflowers are awesome. Um, they're coming out now. Um, I don't know if any of you been, have been seeing, uh, but lupin is in bloom. Um, bays need mostly sunny areas, but they're, they're happening now. Yeah, that's a lupin there on the left. Fantastic flowers they are. Drought tolerant native wildflowers like California aster can really add splash to an open area in late summer. There are many natives that do well in these situations. A selection of different types of native ferns like Western sword or polypody fern, lupin, vine maple, or yerba buena mint add, add a lot of visual interest to the, a garden. A lot of people uh, probably know that San Francisco was originally named after the Yerba Buena Mint plant. Most of us love the look of natural hardscaping in our yards. Flagstones, boulders, stones, and river pebbles can very much add to a pleasing nature aesthetic. Unfortunately, a few of these products are sourced from these fragile and distant ecologies where environmental conditions may be lax. We recommend considering environmental impacts when shopping for hardscape. Mm -hmm. Varying heights are important too in a garden as uh, for, for not only aesthetics, but also for wildlife. In many areas, how tall a plant will grow, impacts to retaining walls and possible impacts to neighbors all need to be considered. If you have room though, we have many hardy and wildlife beneficial trees and arboreal shrubs to choose from. Oak, toyon, ceanothus, and elderberry, some of the wonderful native plants. So uh, when you're getting started, you'll want to uh, consider where you want to plant and evaluate your location. Is it windy or foggy, full sun or shade? 
you have clay soil or a combination of soil types? Is there a creek nearby or is there other fresh water? Um, leaf litter is okay. Many insects lay their eggs in there. And a small brush pile in the winter, not during the fire season, is really, <laughs> uh, that brush pile can be really attractive to birds like wrens and quail um, during the winter. Spider webs are important to uh, hummingbirds. You might consider setting a goal of 75% native plants. Some studies suggest that at least 70% is the magic number to get critical mass to support uh, native birds. Uh, this is a photo from our backyard um, in February. It's a pink flowering current. And um, these bright blooms in winter uh, are really beautiful. And you can enjoy seeing hummingbirds feed there on the nectar. Um, so uh, anyway, you might consider these other uh, concepts when you're uh, planning your uh, backyard or planting space. With local natives, you can plan for a variety of colors or plan for something to bloom in every season. That's what we have in our backyard. We sort of designed our yard so that we would have something blossoming almost every month. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this is, not everyone has uh, water, but uh, it is vital to birds and pre preferably running. So. Um, it doesn't take much uh, uh, to provide the water that birds need. You can just put out a little um, planter uh, and uh, you know the uh, the dish that goes under a, a, a plant and fill that with water. And uh, birds can use that to drink or to bathe in. A water feature, especially if the water is low and running. And the sound of moving water is a for sure bird magnet. Mm -hmm. They can hear that water and they will come, they'll fly right to it. And it also helps this deter mosquitoes too, if it's, if it's uh, moving. Or a shallow water bath works well to attract birds. Saucer from a planter, as Noreen said, is what um, we use them. We've got a couple of those in our backyard and birds definitely come in, especially, uh, in the dry season. Uh, if, it is deep, if it's deep, just place some rounded rocks so that the birds can bathe. Songbirds usually like it one to two inches. A uh, diversity of depths is good for the different size birds. We place ours near a bush or other veg, you know, in vegetation in the backyard so the birds can dry or hide in case a hawk or other predator approaches. And we, uh, it's important to place it at least 15 foot or more from a sliding glass door or large windows to prevent collisions, mm -hmm. uh, as well as to replace the water frequently, um, depending on the type of season and how much use, we'll, we'll uh, replace it completely or partially uh, every other day or so. These are some other tips uh, to help the birds and the insect pollinators. Few things are more rewarding than having native birds nest in your yard. Mm -hmm. Hummingbirds use spider webs and other materials for their nests, so don't clear all the cobwebs. <laughs> you can create conditions conducive to bird nesting with native plants. Nest may be constructed with woven woven twigs, grasses, lichen, and other native plant materials. Some trees are more conducive to nest cavities than others. Woodpe woodpeckers are the primary cavity nesters. They're the home builders of the world for the other, the, the secondary nesters like Western bluebirds and chestnut-backed chickadees. So you can see where this uh, Western bluebird on the right, is probably reusing uh, a cavity that was started by another animal, probably a uh, woodpecker. Along with trees, many songbirds nest in dense shrubbery out of sight. Here's a yellow bush, bush lupin that we found a nest in. Uh, yeah, many. Um, um... White crowned sparrows will nest in this type of dense bush. 
and uh, nest boxes are also an option. Um, but uh, the, the most particular thing about nest boxes is getting the right entry size hole for the, um, the bird species that uh, you're trying to attract. If the hole is too big, then predators like um, an owl or um, other predators can get in there and um, they will take advantage of eggs or chicks. Because uh, we often, you know, humans often will cut dead trees either for firewood or just because, you know, they're hazard or they don't think they look good. Their uh, cavities are in short supply. So the nest boxes have really made a huge difference to uh, bring back some uh, formerly scarce breeders into our area. Birds will often try to nest in human built situations. If you can let them, they usually don't take very long to fledge. And if, uh, if you can be patient, enjoy and clean up, clean up a little bit after their young have fledged. This uh, top left picture is uh, where morning doves had, uh, had nested and fledged on one of our outside um, exhaust pipes, basically. So it was, it was kind of fun to watch them do that. Um, and these are some of the outdoor hazards for birds. I'm not going to go into in depth, but um, I do want to mention that outdoor cats kill over 2.4 billion birds in the United States every year. So if you must let your cat outside, then I encourage you to uh, get a catio or train your cat to walk on a leash. Um, our neighbors have done that. Uh, Golden Gate Audubon has a new program and they have a discount to uh, purchase a catio. Um, and more than a billion pounds of pesticides are applied in the United States each year. Um, it's the most uh, widely, the most widely used insecticides are called neonicotinoids or neonics, and they're lethal to birds and to uh, the insects that the, you know, be because the birds consume the insects. And um, pesticides, uh, they kill uh, the insects and the birds eat them. Uh, they're contributing to the monarch and other butterfly declines. So um, avoid them if you can. Uh, rat poison also uh, kills unintended predators. You've probably um, heard a little bit about that, but when a hawk or an owl eats a poison rodent, um, it dies. Um, and um, if it feeds it to its young, then the young will die as well. Instead, uh, remove food, seal access points, and uh, use appropriately sized snap traps instead of rodenticide. If you need an outdoor light, um, use a motion detector and have the light directed down to where you need it. Uh, this will provide security and illumination for you, and it'll also save you money while preventing harm to birds. So we're going to go over a few plants that you will find that you will find using the super helpful Calscape Garden Planner. There's a, a Calscape Garden Planner right that's uh, specifically for the Bay Area now. If you're uh, if you're calling in from the Bay Area, oaks throughout the lower 48 are keystone species, and the San Francisco Bay Area has a wonderful diversity of them. Non-deciduous live oak species present in the Bay Area include coastal, interior live oak, canyon live oak, and the rare palmer oak. Deciduous oaks include black, blue, and the tallest of California's 20 oak species, the stately valley oak. Oaks are central to many, many birds' lives, and, and many species will, species will just not be present without them. Mm -hmm. Another wildlife super beneficial tree is the California buckeye. It has lower low water requirements, yet many large flowers in the spring. Right now, they're really going nuts. We've, we've been seeing many beautiful specimens out there. Being completely deciduous, its gorgeous winter leafless form allows sunlight into the understory too. And it attracts nectarvorous birds and insect loving birds and is a host plant for many butterflies and moths, including the fabulous California sister. Maples everywhere they occur are bird magnets. Our California big leaf maple 
is very fast growing, typically tops out at about 50 to 60 feet, but can reach 100 feet. Too large for many residential gardens, but if you have the room, it's a real winner. Where temperatures become cold enough, it produces beautiful fall colors and as winter deciduous. Native to Western North America, mostly near the Pacific coast, from southernmost Alaska, south to Southern California. Some stands are also found inland in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And a tiny population even occurs in central Idaho, features large palmate leaves, typical of, of maples. The holly leaf cherry is a slow growing tree uh, that produces small cherries. Um, we have a, a blow up there in the uh, lower right. And um, birds love those cherries. They're really tiny, um, but if you've ever tried one, they're really delicious. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, the, it's a really beautiful, um, smaller growing tree. Some uh, people consider it more of a shrub form. And um, it's green year round. Uh, the Western tiger swallowtail uh, depends on this uh, species and um, it grows in San Francisco. The handsome toyon is considered a shrub but can grow to medium tree size. The flowers are white and the fruit is red. Useful as a bank stabilizing plant and works well for hedges. Easy to grow, requires very little water and is deer resistant. Great nectar source in the spring and is especially sought after by thrushes and waxwings in the fall. We have one in our suit we're in a very urban area and uh, it's it's certainly the center of our garden and in the uh, and you know like people call it the Christmas berry and um, and then it'll just be covered with thousands of berries in the fall and then suddenly the birds will show up in about a two or three week period they can <laughs> clean it out but it's really fun to watch mm -hmm. most of Earth's manzanita species are found in california and their deep red bark is really interesting i, I th think they're really stunning um, they produce these small flowers and small white berries which attracts native bees butterflies and birds the common manzanita does well on slopes and in a low and is a low water use shrub like tree. Heart Lake, Big Sur, and Hooker's manzanita all grow in the San Francisco area. So you can check out Calscape and Cal Flora to see which manzanitas are perfect for your yard. Um, in the wild, um, let's see, this is a coyote bush, and um, this is a one of the keystone um, species. Um, it's uh, common and hardy. Uh, it's associated with coastal scrub and upland habitats. Um, it's underrated and drought tolerant. Um, it co-associates with over 400 species of other plants, uh, insects, and animals in the wild. It's attractive to flycatchers, sparrows, finches, mockingbirds, thrashers, waxwings, vireos, grosbeaks, crows, jays, warblers, chickadees, and titmice. And in the late summer and fall, um, it flowers. And it's unique because um, the female has the white flower that's uh, depicted in the center, and uh, the male has a yellow flower. So it's a, a really uh, beautiful plant. And I know there are um, low growing forms uh, that are often used in bank stabilizing uh, situations. Another low water use um, shrub is the hairy honeysuckle um, twin or berry. twin berry. <laughs> and uh, hummingbirds, songbirds, butterflies, and native bees really enjoy this plant. Um, it blooms in the winter and it also has pink flowers. Uh, the blue blossom is one of our really uh, aromatic uh, plants. It's uh, sometimes referred to as a California lilac, and um, the genus is Ceanothus. There are several different um, uh, types, the Oleganthus, Thurisiflorus, um, but um, they're, they're blooming now. So if you go out and you can see this beautiful purple uh, 
purplish blue uh, blossom. It blooms spring through uh, early fall. It can be trimmed up to look like a tree and um, it does really well in rocky areas. It's a nice um, plant that, um, that does well in a variety of situations. Um, one one uh, interesting fact about that is you can take those blossoms and um, uh, rub them in your hand with water and it makes a, a soap. Um, this plant um, should be watered for the first year or two and then um, no additional watering is needed uh, once it's established, but a variety of um, birds associate with ceanothus, um, including chickadees and titmice, sparrows, um, grosbeaks, woodpeckers, orioles, thrushes, uh, warblers, nuthatches, mockingbirds, thrashers, vireos, and waxwings, and uh, butterflies love it too. So everybody loves blue blossom. <laughs> Highly recommend it. California fuchsia is an easy to grow low water plant that blooms in the summer and fall. And you can see by those tubular flowers that uh, the hummingbirds love it. Uh, evening primrose is another um, beautiful plant. Uh, this attracts a lot of uh, different birds as well. Um, so uh, this is a, a a photograph of a, uh, one of the sites in San Francisco, but it, it grows in really, um, uh, I would call it poor soil uh, conditions. You might see it growing along a uh, road and um, uh, birds love to eat the seed of this plant. It produces quite a few seeds and um, um, Let's see, uh, finches, goldfinches love the seed. So yeah. it leave the seed out and you'll see uh, goldfinches in the fall and the winter. Another favorite is checker bloom, Soldacia malviflora, common native perennial herb in the malvaceae or the mallow family that grows well here. It tends to grow in dry, open flats as a ground cover. It has a bright green leaves and one inch deep pink flowers. It's doing right now. I mean, well, well, almost any flowering plant is doing well right now, but uh, this one uh, tolerates a lot, a wide variety of soils. And it's most often started from seed and sometimes behaves like an annual. Uh, this is another um, plant, the yarrow, that is really uh, easy to grow and um, does really well um, in a variety of locations, um, low water use. Um, in uh, New Mexico and Southern Colorado, it's called sumajillo or little feather. Um, that's because of the shape of the leaves, um, but it has been uh, used medicinally by uh, Native Americans and uh, it was used for pain relief and fever reduction. Uh, the plant uh, flowers from May through June, so that's really great. You, you might, um, I just noticed it uh, with lots of uh, ladybugs on it, uh, lady beetles. Um, this is one of the resources that we wanted to uh, let you know about. It's called Calscape, and um, it is a zip code based uh, garden planner. There's one um, specific to the Bay Area. Um, and what you can do is put your zip code in for the uh, for your location or for where you want to plant, and then um, it'll ask you a few different questions about. You can select from elegant homeowner association, outdoor living space, or California natural spaces, and um, it, you can also design for birds. Uh, butterflies, um, uh, deer resistant, and I think fire resistant as well. And um, then uh, you can develop a, a list of plants that you can take shopping. Uh, you can also choose uh, plants that are based on sun or shade and uh, the water that you have available in your space. So that's uh, gardenplanner.calscape.org. But um, uh, this is an, oh, sorry. On the right hand side is um, an example of the information that they provide on each of the plants for, um, for that area. So once you've answered all the questions, they'll come up with a, a list of plants that would be appropriate. 
And um, another resource is National Audubon's tool. And this can bring up a list of plants based on your zip code as well. And it shows the plant um, and bird species associated uh, with those plants. It also gives information about um, some uh, nurseries su that supply those plants. Um, this is one of the plants that came up for Alameda and Contra Costa County. Um, it's from National Audubon's uh, website and it's uh, black sage. It grows well under oaks and it has a lovely aroma. So that's um, at the bottom is the website, Audubon Plants for Birds. Um, so there's detail about each plant. Some other resources. Um, these are books that um, if you're interested in, in reading, um, these are some of the books that we have in our library. Couple more that we use quite a lot. Uh, Here's uh, the GGAS and CNPS, uh, Yerba Buena partner on the plants for birds. Uh, several plants are selected each year to focus on local plants and local native birds. Grow your garden with local native plants, attracting more birds each year while supporting local nurseries. In uh, 2022, these are the, um, the plants that we highlighted. And so we're trying to um, get uh, people to know about these plants and about the birds that are attracted to them. Um, so detailed information about the plants um, and the birds are available on both the um, CMPS and the uh, Golden Gate Audubon website. And here's a, a QR code that'll take you to, the, uh, to that resource. Um, there's also a new uh, plants for birds guide. Uh, Noreen and the design team are working on a 2023 version right now, but that'll probably be, that'll come out later on in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a guide that um, you can take a look at. This is also on the CMPS and the Golden Gate Audubon website. And um, this talks about um, different heights and where you might see uh, different birds. Um, There's also a Spanish version of it. So uh, all of that's available if, uh, from the CNPS Yerba Buena uh, website and look for plants for birds. And um, these are the nurseries that are participating. We're really glad that uh, Slope Garden Center um, is, <laughs> is uh, participating in this program. Um, and uh, other awesome. resources include uh, butterfly host plants. That, um, so that's available on the website. Um, yeah, if you go to that biodiversity resources, there's, there's a lot of uh, um, information on attracting in butterflies and birds. These are some events coming up this spring. Um, and these are things that you can do, uh, support local biodiversity by um, going to Sloat and getting some native plants. Yeah. <laughs> Plant those uh, native plants. And um, we encourage you to uh, consider joining Golden Gate Audubon and the California Native Plant Society. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for letting for uh, the opportunity to present this info to you. Oh my gosh, that was so informative. I'm like super inspired right now. I don't, I told you before the class, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a bird person. I don't know about birds, but I know I'm getting into native plants. And what was most interesting to me, and I kind of want you to, I want to hear it again, because I want to be sure that I have it right. But the, you were saying that native plants are at least 10% more nutrient for uh, the native what, birds. Is that correct? Uh, the berries and uh, in native plants is, is, is more, uh, it provides more uh, beneficial nutrients to birds than the um, ornamental berries. So um, that's incredible. Yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of research done and, uh, and, you know, we started out with the question, because we live in San Francisco, why are breeding birds not, why are birds hardly breeding in San Francisco? 
you know, so that was kind of like where we came from. This was our question when we started looking into this like 30 away a long time ago. <laughs> and um, and so we're like, you know, just one thing led to the other uh, when we started doing the research on that. And basically, we, you know, we kind of figured out why birds are, you know, are, have been in decline, not only in, you know, in the nation, and that has to do with a lot of our, you know, the reasons we showed about, you know, insecticides and just, and on down the uh, line, but also um, that people have switched out the local native plants to, you know, other plants. And uh, they just don't, the insects just can't figure that out. And then the birds can't figure that out. I mean, you'll never see a bird feeding in a ginkgo, for example. It just doesn't support any local insect. It's a beautiful tree, but you know, it isn't, it isn't our tree, so. Right, it, it's unique to Asia and, and in Asia, it has benefits there. But, um, and insects that goes after you know they use it there and we don't want their insects <laughs> <laughs> we definitely don't want their insects that's, no, that's I, always, I mean, always, always bad news yeah it, it makes total sense i just i haven't really just thought about it in that way and so i think that's that that's a really good reason to plant more native plants mm -hmm. um and then I was also thinking about when you were talking, and I'm glad you brought up Doug Tallamy and we did have him talk with us and we have that recording available. He's, he, we reference him regularly, um, yeah. his work, like all of us. And so absolutely check out his website and his books and homegrown national park and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. But one, one of the things that he was saying was that the caterpillar is the most important uh, thing in the food chain, basically, because right. and 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 it feed, because it feeds so many birds, and then it comes, you know, it sort of like ripples out from there. Right. Um, and I'm glad that you said about you know it's okay if we have holes in our leaves because that's food for the birds, and so I think just sort of sh like shifting our mindset, so. When we see some insects in the garden, we don't just go and spray it really quick. We just realize that it's a food for something, um, and it can be it can create more of an ecosystem. Really, if you let nature sort of like work it out on its own instead of us. Right. Yeah, I mean there are we there are problems from introduced pathogens that sometimes you know spray is the only thing but mm -hmm. in general no you don't you know we've never had to spray anything i mean occasionally when one of our plants gets chomped down we yeah. look on there and it's like oh and then we'll see the lady beetles eating the aphids <laughs> and it's like oh okay they work it out you know yeah i don't spray anything in my garden either the only thing that drives me insane is scale and if I get scale on anything I just toss the whole thing because I can't deal with it yeah. I don't want to spray it <laughs> yeah I mean I don't know that much about scale but our some of our bigger problems are really from introduced insects you know yeah. especially on the agricultural scale like you know you'll hear about oh they're the sharpshooter or the yeah you know, we've lost we've lost our chestnut trees to an introduced pathogen or the elm trees and the Dutch elm disease. The mm -hmm. ash borer is also from, you know, Eura from Eurasia. These, when these insects break over, it, it can really wreak havoc on our environment. Mm -hmm. It would be a very different place back uh, east had the chestnut trees still survived. Yeah. So anyway, you know, it's, it's us moving things around. It, it, mm -hmm. It's kind of... Uh, it's a it's a dodgy proposition sometimes. But well, I'm so, sorry. Go ahead. There are a variety <laughs> of, of beautiful local natives that uh, right. we can put back. Yeah, I mean yeah, there's absolutely. 769 species native to San Francisco, tiny San Francisco County. That's incredible. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Well, I I do want to say that Sloat is super happy to partner on this. Um, project with you. We do have native plants, of course, and we do have 
not all the locations, but several of the locations have the featured plants. Mm -hmm. All the stores are aware of the featured plants on this webinar. So um, if we don't have the exact plant, we can offer uh, an alternative or we can see if we can order it for you. In the 20 some years I've worked for Sloat, I've never seen our native plant section as in each store as large as it is. So just as, as a company, we're definitely devoted Thank you. to expanding this area. And, you know, our webinars, we've, we've done a, a ton of native plants. And so, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to that this is all being supported and um yeah and you know having said that you know even though we're native plant nuts okay we're we totally get it the, the beauty of a rose is you know mm -hmm. okay, we love it we've got a lemon tree in our yard mm -hmm. it's a meyer lemon it's delicious <laughs> no and i think that's we were talking about that before it's i think sometimes it can be intimidating because you feel like you have to do all or nothing or something and i, I was telling eddie and noreen that I'm just making it a, a personal goal in mind to put a native plant in every single design that I do. Just one, mm -hmm. just even one native plant mm -hmm. is going to be better than none. Um, and, you know, typically if you, if you do one, then you end up doing more than one and whatnot. And you can do native plants in containers too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't have to work, especially well that way. Yeah. We've got, we've got a bunch because our yard is so tiny. we we put in, you know, containers on, on the, in the concrete parts. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And just really getting behind the idea that like anything you do is going to be helpful, however yeah. small. Yeah. Well, you so know, there's lots of people, there, there are more and more people that have gone, some of them are just gone, they're hundred percent native, you know, mm -hmm. and some of the designs are spectacular, mm -hmm. especially these folks that live out in the sand dunes here. Oh my, their, your, their yards just are fantastic. They've got the lupins and it's inspiring. You know, just mm -hmm. all sorts of flowering plants and it really can be gorgeous. Well, thank you both so much for your time. I really appreciate everything that you had to share. Um, just so everybody knows this is being recorded and the recording will be available on our website and on our YouTube this Friday. I know that there was a lot of... Um, they they had a lot of data and spreadsheets and, and and such and what's nice about the recordings is you can go back and you can screenshot and you you can sort of review that information closer mm -hmm. um so that'll be available and again please check out our future classes coming up it's we're at about an hour now so i'm gonna shut it down so we can all start making dinner <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us and thanks again eddie and noreen i really appreciate your presentation have a good evening thanks, Jen. thanks Jen. take care bye-bye bye-bye